In this video, we'll review progressive lesions. That is um, some kind of damage that gets progressively worse over time. Uh, we're not going to include the neurodegenerative disorders, which do progress and get worse over time. Uh, instead, we'll focus on um, external damage to neurons as opposed to the kind of internal genetic components that go in with neurodegenerative disorders. So two big topics, brain tumors and infections. And here we can see uh, just how variable the cell types can be in tumors. So here they've, they've uh, pulled out a brain tumor and found teeth in it. So tumor cells de-differentiate, that is they start off as one kind of cell, let's say a nerve cell, and they then turn into another type of cell, in this case, teeth. So part of tumorogenesis is losing your normal phenotype and you begin to misbehave. And the big problem here is that we reproduce uncontrollably, pushing on our neighbors and stealing their blood flow. And we already know that doesn't end well for neurons. The second big topic are infections. And there's a few things that we'll go over there. This could be a bacterial or viral infection that leads to meningitis or encephalitis. It could be some kind of infectious protein, like uh, a, a prionosis, so some kind of prion disease. Or it might be a little brain-eating amoeba we'll touch on at the end. But first, let's go through our brain tumors. So here we have... Uh, some kind of growth, that's what we call a mass lesion, so some kind of damaged area that occupies space, that will kill off neurons. And they can do this in a fairly simple mechanism by spitting out a bunch of glutamate. Or, because they have mass, that is they occupy space, they then increase intracranial pressure, which either pushes on neurons or blood vessels, and either way, it doesn't end well for neurons. So first, just a quick review of cell division, because this is the problem in, in uh, cancer. Cells don't control their cell cycle well. Now, normally we um, progress through the cell cycle in an orderly fashion, so here's the representation of the cell cycle. Uh, neurons aren't actually in this, so they, they exit, they live in G0, so that is they, they just duck out over here and don't go through the cell cycle. When they do, they die. So they don't do that anymore. These red gates are the checkpoints. So these are places where the cell will stop the cell cycle and it won't progress unless there's good reason to. So when neurons hit this gate, they just head on out. And that's why neurons are post-mitotic. They just head over here, G0. If we get some kind of external uh, stimulus to say, please divide, then we pass on through and we enter S phase where we synthesize our DNA, we grow a little bit more, and then we go through M phase, mitosis. Uh, that requires that our DNA is in good order. There's no point in doing that. Uh, we've separated our chromosomes properly, and then, hey, we're back. Okay, so moving around, so what causes this dial to spin are the proto-oncogenes. So they're not oncogenes yet. Oncogenes are a bad thing. The non-mutated version are the proto-oncogenes. Uh, great examples would be cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases. So there's different cyclins. They're called cyclins because they, uh, their levels are cyclic. So they come up, they go down, depending on which phase we're in. So different cyclins activate different cyclin-dependent kinases. And those kinases phosphorylate different parts of the cell to progress us through the cell cycle. For example, when we're transitioning into S phase, well, we probably need to turn on DNA polymerase. And so kinases will help us do that. The gates here are the tumor suppressor genes. So these are the checkpoints. These prevent the cell cycle until something uh, happens. So these suppress tumor growth by preventing the cell cycle. Great example is P53. P53 is uh, very commonly mutated in cancers. And what this does is detect DNA damage. That is, have we accumulated a bunch of mutations? If we have, don't progress through the cell cycle. 
So in the short term, P53 turns on its partner, P21. P just stands for protein. It's 53 kilodaltons. And this protein is 21 kilodaltons, so it's a little smaller. Anywho, what P21 does is inhibit those cyclin-dependent kinases that advances through the cell cycle. So if your DNA is damaged, please don't divide. This gives the cell time to fix any of the damage. If we can properly copy our DNA, great. Go ahead and divide. If we can't, if P53 remains active in the long term, what it does is trigger the expression of pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. So this is going to turn on uh, something called BH3-only proteins, whatever. They're all pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins. And those do exactly what their name tells us. They trigger apoptosis. So P53 gives us some time to fix the problem. And if we can't, it fixes the problem the only way possible, apoptosis. Now the formation of tumors requires mutation in one of those two types of genes. And if we mutate an onco a, a proto-oncogene, we form oncogenes. That is if we give gain of function mutations. That is, they are active way more than they should be. In this cartoon over here, we think of the proto-oncogenes as the gas advancing us through the cell cycle, and tumor suppressor genes are the breaks, preventing us from going through the cell cycle when we shouldn't. Oncogenes progress us no matter what, and as you can see, we've run into the wall of cancer here. Tumor suppressor genes, uh, when they're mutated, they lose their function. Notice the parachute is much smaller. Oh no, even though we have the same amount of gas, we're not breaking as much, and we've run into the wall of cancer again. About half of the cancers have a P53 mutation. That's why that tumor suppressor gene was pointed out. Now, when we accumulate mutations, what this leads to is anaplasia, which is the presence of multiple cell types. In other words, we find not just astrocytes, for example, as we can see down here. So here's a low-grade astrocytoma. As we advance, we see the astrocytes don't really look much like astrocytes anymore. Um, along the way, we see pleomorphism, which is shown here in the inset. Here we're looking at the nuclei. You can see they look kind of variable. Some nuclei look a little normal. This one's kind of small. This one's kind of elongated. Here we can see that pleomorphism a little more clearly down here. So very large nucleus of this cell. Uh, this one's kind of abnormally shaped. That one's kind of nice and round. Notice they're variable. And that tells us that we've got some highly mutated cells and some not quite as highly mutated cells. This is indicative of a higher grade tumor. So to go from grade 2 to grade 3 astrocytomas, we need to see that pleomorphism. Now going from grade 3 to grade 4, we're going to see some additional things. For example, we see necrosis. So these starred areas, that's showing us these big areas of cell death. And that's because the tumors are doing what they do. They're growing at the expense of their neighbors. Another thing we see in higher grade um, tumors is the formation of new blood vessels. Because, hey, if you're going to grow, you're going to need some blood. And that's what this is right here, a newly formed little capillary bed. That keeps the tumors well fed. Of course, this comes at a cost in the brain because those... Uh, blood vessels are leaky. They don't have a blood-brain barrier. That allows a lot of fluid and other bad things to escape. Now, just like we see variable uh, shapes of cells in their nuclei, we also see variable growth rates. So some tumors are what we call benign. So sure, they've de-differentiated a bit, but they don't grow fast enough for us to worry. And in some cases, we'll leave these alone. They might be hard to get to, and we might do more harm than good by removing the benign tumor. Now, of course, there's always a risk that benign tumors progress to malignant tumors. And all malignant tumors means is that they grow very quickly and they are invasive. That is, they can metastasize, moving from one location to another. But if we have this nice encapsulated tumor and it doesn't grow too fast, maybe we leave it alone. If we go in and cut it up, we run the risk of perhaps un unleashing some of these tumor cells. Obviously, malignant tumors have a much worse prognosis than benign tumors.
All right, as far as primary brain tumors go, you can see that these are luckily fairly rare. So every year about 20 per 100,000, but that of course is highly variable depending on your age, and age is a major risk factor. Notice as you get older, the risk of a primary brain tumor increases. You also increase your risk if you're exposed to any sort of ionizing radiation, that is things like x-rays, gamma rays, things that can damage your DNA. That's what's going on there. We're accumulating DNA damage. We run the risk of mutating those proto-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes and having an uncontrolled cell cycle. Now, some of these DNA um, mutations are passed down. So heritable mutations that decrease the function of tumor suppressors or increase the function of proto-oncogenes increase the risk. So a family history of tumors is another risk factor. And then there are certain infectious agents that hijack the cell cycle, Epstein-Barr virus, for example, and increase the risk of tumor formation. Now, as far as primary brain tumors go, there's two broad types. The first broad type would be the gliomas. That is, they are derived from some glial cell. As you can see here, the most common is the high-grade astrocytoma, accounting for about a quarter or a fifth of all primary brain tumors. And that's a bad thing because they have the worst prognosis. Now, of course, before we become high-grade, there are low-grade astrocytomas. These are more common in the frontal lobes. Obviously, the high ones are too. Right? Uh, longer prognosis here because it takes time to progress to the high-grade astrocytoma. Uh, much better prognosis is there for neuromas, that is also called schwannomas because they derive from schwann cells. These are typically benign, and so the prognosis is excellent. Uh, in fact, if they are found late enough in life, we may just leave them alone. Because if you find them on that eighth cranial nerve and you go cutting that up, you won't be able to hear and your balance will suffer. Oligodendrogliomas um, have a worse prognosis than neuromas. Uh, luckily, they're a little less common. They tend to bleed and recur, so that, that affects their prognosis for sure. And you can see as we increase the grade, we decrease the survivability. Ependymomas are from ependymal cells, so they're far more likely to obstruct CSF flow because remember, ependymal cells make the CSF. Still much better prognosis than the astrocytomas. Um, medulloblastomas are probably from some sort of neural progenitor cell, but notice my question mark there. These are the least common unless you're a child, then they're more common. Uh, often we find these in the cerebellum, so they affect balance and movement. Depending on when it occurs, you can see the prognosis is still not great. That's what we should take away from this slide, is that gliomas generally have pretty poor prognosis other than neuromas. If we go on to our non-gliomas, the other broad category, we can see here that they have pretty good prognosis. That's what's going on in this column over here. Very good prognosis, except for one of them. But the most common, that is the meningiomas, well, these have really good survival. Now, because they affect the meninges, they can, of course, grow, push on the... Uh, brain there, increase intracranial pressure, right? That's true for all of these. We'll move down in prevalence here. I'm not going to hammer on these very much. Uh, what I want you to notice is that the survival is typically very good for non-gliomas. I want you to also notice that meningiomas are the most common primary tumor, accounting for about a third of them. And primary CNS lymphoma is the outlier here because it has absolutely horrible survivability. Luckily, it's not too terribly common, and the use of antiretroviral treatments lower this prevalence even further. And the problem with them is that we tend to see a lot of uh, periventricular lesions. So we see multiple lesions 
and they're kind of hard to access. So surgery isn't a great treatment option. Radiation or chemotherapy do increase survivability, but this is still not great. And radiation therapy and chemotherapy come with their own uh, set of nasty side effects. Spinal cord tumors, as you can see, is are far less common uh, than our primary brain tumors, having less than one per 100,000 per year here. Same risk factors, age, radiation, family history, viral infections. We can distinguish the location of a spinal cord tumor based on the type of pain they produce. The rarest tumor would be the intramedullary tumors that is within the cord. So here's the intramedullary tumor. Uh, you can see accounting for a mere 5% of the tumors here. These create that burning and diffuse pain as opposed to the sharp radiating pain that occurs whenever we stimulate the meninges. So these would be the intradural or extradural spinal cord tumors. So we're outside of the cord, stimulating the dura, and that leads to a sharper radiating pain. And it radiates because we are affecting the roots here. Now you'll notice here that only about half are primary tumors. The other half come from metastatic tumors. And those metastatic tumors tend to um, set up shop in those uh, posterior regions of the spine. Um, and this is because of the blood vessels lacking valves. So it's easier for metastasis to occur outside of the spinal cord itself. And that's why we'll tend to see the metastatic tumors extra dural. Now metastatic brain tumors are um, probably less common than primary tumors, but they're kind of hard to distinguish as you can see here. So notice the little squiggle, about 14 per 100,000. So think of them being maybe about as common, maybe a little less common uh, than primary brain tumors. Also think of them as having the same risk factors, but do think of them as having a generally worse prognosis, and that's because they're metastatic. In order to get there, they had to invade. Thus, they are by definition not benign. We tend to find them along the distribution of the middle cerebral artery, and that's because of how they get there. They go in through the blood. So common sources are going to be the lungs. Lungs account for about 40% of our metastatic brain tumors. And that's because after blood goes to the lungs, goes to the heart, and then gets pumped out the aorta. Very quickly, we have these branches uh, that take us to the brain, so the, the carotid, subclavian arteries here. These are fairly early branch points, and they'll go on up into the brain with the um, external carotid becoming the internal carotid and eventually forming the middle cerebral artery. Hence the middle cerebral artery being the typical place to find metastatic brain tumors. So once a tumor happens, there's a few ways that it can kill off neurons. There are direct effects of the tumor itself, so pressure from the tumor. Pressure leads to demyelination. So the first thing that gets popped is the myelin sheath, not the axons. So here we're just looking at a cross section, I believe in the cerebellum. And the blue stain is showing us myelin. So we've got a bunch of myelinated axons. Each one of these white holes here is an axon. It's not brain damage. Over here, we can see axons here. Here's an axon, another one, another one. But notice the absence of myelin. We don't have that nice thick blue outline. And that's what happens early on. We get demyelination. Demyelination is a problem because when the action potential hits that demyelinated internode, there are no ion channels. So the action potential fails, and this is what we call a conduction block. So that demyelinated segment blocks the conduction of action potentials. And this obviously creates neurological signs because neurons can't communicate anymore. So this can create weakness, sensory loss. You get the point. Now, how do we recover? Well, there's a couple of ways. Early on, we can reinsert ion channels. So those internodes can get filled up with ion channels, and that way we can propagate the action potential. This is cool because we can propagate action potentials, but it's bad because 
each action potential costs more. So this increases metabolic stress. Every action potential costs more ATP. And every time we make ATP, remember, we run the risk of making those pesky free radicals. Those then damage DNA, proteins, and lipids, potentially making that mitochondrion leaky and triggering apoptosis. Now, if we remove the source of pressure, we can indeed remyelinate, and that's what's going on over here. Have a look. We're blue again. Cool. Remyelination occurs because oligodendrocytes can reproduce. Neurons can't, but the glia can't. So after we get rid of the pressure and we're not continually pushing on and popping the myelin sheath, we can make more of it. How nice. If that's as far as it goes, full functional recovery is expected. However, if we don't remove the pressure and we keep that metabolic stress high, we'll eventually lose neurons and get progressive decline. Okay, so here's a nice little cartoon of what's going on. We get some pressure. That kills off this oligodendrocyte. You can see here, it's toast. And we have these demyelinated axon segments. If we remove the pressure, other oligodendrocytes can take over. Cool. If we don't remyelinate, what we can do is reinsert ion channels. Let's make it green. So plus ion channels. Green means go. So if we add ion channels all along the length here, then we can propagate those action potentials. It just costs more. So the bad part of those ion channels is that they increase metabolic stress. Now, some neurons don't make it. You can see these are crapping out here. That's because of the metabolic stress. And that leads to apoptosis. I think I've probably covered that. Okay. So after that initial demyelination, what else is going on directly? Well, okay, already covered this first point here. If we remain demyelinated, that ion channel insertion causes oxidative stress, which leads to apoptosis. All right. If we continue to put mechanical pressure on the neurons, remember, everything's mechanically gated to some degree. So that stimulates neurons, potentially leading to excitotoxicity. But wait, that's not all. Tumors also release glutamate. Here we can see a great example of that over here. So we'll start at the bottom. And what we see in, in high-grade tumors, like a glioblastoma, is this right here. There's a little epileptiform activity. Here's another one. So we see essentially seizures. We see hyperactive neurons. That's because of this massive like glioblastoma that they have here in this poor mouse model of glioblastoma. Okay, so what's triggering the seizure? Could be pressure, but it's also glutamate release. Let's take a look at the data up here. We can just do A, B is another recording. It shows the same thing, I promise. Okay, here we are just coasting along, and we see these little excitatory events. Notice those downward deflections. They're a lot more noticeable over here when we get rid of the magnesium. What's going on there? Don't forget. The NMDA receptor is normally blocked by magnesium. So if we use a magnesium-free solution, we get rid of the magnesium. And therefore, NMDA receptors aren't blocked anymore. So that's why we see this massive increase in these excitatory currents here. All those downward deflections are showing you excitation. Huh. Well, maybe that's just from neurons. Maybe, but probably also from tumors. Because the way that tumors release uh, glutamate is not through firing action potentials, but instead through this cysteine glutamate antiporter. That is, it takes in cysteine and spits out glutamate. So SAS inhibits that, and notice, huh, we got a little less excitation. 
cool. So clearly tumors are spitting out glutamate and it's triggering NMDA receptors. But in order to prove that finally, they put on the NMDA receptor antagonist, AP5. And you'll notice after a minute and a half or so, boop, 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 oh, we're silent. No more NMDA receptor activity. So tumors are spitting out glutamate and that of course triggers excitotoxicity. And once we lose neurons, functional recovery can only be incomplete. Glia can be replaced, but not neurons. And so the neurons that are lost, we lose their function. All right, tumors can also affect other structures besides neurons. For example, they can impede CSF flow. So here's the cerebral aqueduct right here in the midbrain. And the important part about this is that it's the smallest part of our ventricular system. So it's easy to compress. Now the ventricles are this internal structure containing cerebrospinal fluid. And this is a liquid cushion. What it does is make the brain seem like it weighs a whole lot less, so it doesn't crush itself with its own weight. And it provides a nice solution that can dissolve the ions and neurotransmitters and nutrients and wastes and whatnot, so we can circulate them throughout the brain. Tumors that affect the midbrain, for example, this pineal papilloma here, Notice where we are, here's the midbrain. We're compressing that cerebral aqueduct, leading to fluid accumulation. Here's the lateral ventricles, third ventricle. And this might not look like much to you, but now we're seeing this massive enlargement of the lateral ventricles. They should be like, you know, this big. But they're, they're massively enlarged. Uh, the third ventricle, also very big. It should be a nice thin strip there. I'll get that out of the way. So we get this enlargement of the ventricles. That is hydrocephalus. Guess what that does? Increases intracranial pressure. The same thing the tumor does. But now, by affecting the flow of CSF, we're further increasing intracranial pressure. What that can do is lead to ischemia. It could be the intracranial pressure if we have hydrocephalus, but it could also be just the tumor itself. Remember, they're mass lesions. They occupy space. Hey, they can push brain tissue over too. So that pressure pushes on blood vessels leading to ischemia. And here we can see a little ischemic lesion. That's the bright part right there where my laser pointer is. That lesion is not in the tumor. We have to scroll down quite a bit to see the tumor. There it is right there. So the lesion is like up here, but the tumor is down here. How does it do that? By pushing on blood vessels and causing ischemia. Here's a nice little cartoon of that. Tumor grows, pushes on blood vessel. Maybe it invades and blocks it from the inside. Either way, we decrease blood flow. That's going to be a problem. Of course, we could also increase blood flow. That's also going to be a problem. Isn't that something? No matter which direction you go, it's bad for you. So the way that we could do that is by releasing factors that increase blood flow, things that trigger an inflammatory response and lead to edema, right? So we increase blood flow. Fluid comes out here. We can see edema here. What we can also see is a really nice uh, hematoma, and that's because this metastatic tumor that came in from the lungs is really aggressive. It forms its own leaky blood vessels. That's the angiogenesis, the creation of blood vessels, and these are leaky. So what comes out? Fluid and blood. Both of these occupy space, increasing intracranial pressure. And here we can see an increase in intracranial pressure right over here. I drew the midline with this red dotted line. Now what you'll notice is that this tissue over here should be on the left side. Well, patient's right side. But notice it's crossed midline. That's a clear sign of elevated intracranial pressure. It's what we call midline shift. That's because of this hematoma and the edema. That's the kind of dark tissue around here. It's full of fluid. That is pushing over on the brain tissue. Of course, that will then lead to ischemia. And oh, by the way, blood has a lot more potassium and glutamate in it than the brain. So those trigger excitotoxicity. And if we're damaging neurons, we can create reactive astrocytosis. What also does that would be things from the blood like albumin. So when astrocytes pick up albumin, that triggers them to become reactive. 
we don't pick up as much potassium or glutamate. And as you can see here, either one of these options leads to excitotoxicity. Okay, so pretty similar to all other lectures. Of course, there's only so many ways to kill a neuron. And similar to other lectures, we've got a crazy flow chart here to follow, but it all starts at the tumor. So what's it going to do? Well, it could spit out glutamate. Glutamate can then trigger excitotoxicity, or it could make new blood vessels that are leaky, and that allows blood to bring the glutamate and potassium along, and that leads to excitotoxicity. Of course, if we have blood entering or the tumor itself, those can both trigger an inflammatory response leading to reactive gliosis, and so we don't pick up as much potassium and glutamate, and there you can see excitotoxicity. Okay, maybe it's the tumor or the inflammation or the blood that's coming out. We increase intracranial pressure. What's the problem? Ischemia, leading to excitotoxicity. Or we mechanically stimulate neurons, leading to excitotoxicity. Or we demyelinate the axon, creating conduction block, giving us the short-lived neurological signs. And then, over time, if we don't handle the tumor, we reinsert ion channels so we can propagate the action potential, but now we have oxidative stress. No matter what road you go down, brain tumors are not good for you. Another thing not good for you would be infectious agents that are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain or infect the meninges. So there's a couple options here. We could do that whole intracranial pressure thing like we just went through, and we'll touch on it again. Infectious agents can also directly enter neurons and kill them in a dramatic fashion. So just a quick primer on inflammation here before we proceed. When we have either injury, and that is necrosis, or infection, these have what we call DAMPs or PAMPs, damage-associated molecular patterns. These are just intracellular proteins or DNA. Stuff that should be inside the cell is now outside. The only way that happens is with injury. Infection, if we have some kind of bacterial or viral protein, hey, those can get detected as well. So we have either a damage or pathogen associated molecular pattern. That just means thing inside the cell. So damps and pamps, those trigger inflammation. And the whole point of inflammation is to increase blood flow to the area where we have damage or infection. The idea there, the blood is going to bring the white blood cells that are going to clean up the mess. So we need to increase blood flow by vasodilating, and we should increase the permeability of our blood vessels. That's the inflammatory response. Here we can see an increase in infiltration of white blood cells following heart attack. So here's normal heart tissue. Notice it's not surrounded by a whole bunch of other cells here in these spaces. Down here, following myocardial infarction, that tissue damage leads to an inflammatory response, and we've got a whole bunch of white blood cells that are there to help uh, clean up the mess in that damaged heart. All right, so those damps and pamps trigger inflammation by binding to receptors. Uh, there's a few of these. Toll-like receptors is a, is a big class of them. So that's the blue protein here. Notice the color coding. I've tried to match it. Okay, so some, some cell um, has its toll-like receptor stimulated by a damp or a pamp. What that's going to do is activate some proteins called shedases that cause the cell to shed proteins. And what it does is cut that pro-cytokine into a little fragment. So now it's soluble. So the cytokine was embedded in the membrane, then the shedase shaves off the external component, and now it's free to diffuse. Now to keep this whole thing going, toll-like receptors also trigger transcription factors that go to the nucleus and make more pro-cytokines. Of course, the shed A's will still be active, and it'll go and cut this one, but I didn't animate that. Okay, so once the cytokines are released, they then trigger inflammation. And so what these secreted proteins will do, uh, TNF-alpha is a good uh, option there. That's a good example. Interleukins, there's a whole bunch of these. These cytokines are secreted little bits of protein that then go and trigger inflammation. So they'll stimulate the vascular endothelia, for example to spit out things like prostaglandins, 
Those prostaglandins then inhibit smooth muscle, leading to vasodilation. So the cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, causes the endothelial cells to make a whole bunch of cyclooxygenases that then make prostaglandins, and we spit those out. Those then act on the nearby smooth muscle, and it causes them to relax. So it acts on receptors, of course, on the surface, we increase cyclic AMP, protein kinase A causes relaxation. You remember all this stuff, I'm sure. And when the smooth muscle relax, they're not constricted as much, therefore we vasodilate. The whole point there is to, again, increase blood flow. And we also increase permeability, allowing stuff to exit like white blood cells. And, of course, fluid that comes with them. Fluid that, remember, contains potassium and, and glutamate. But we'll get to that. Now, the other thing that cytokines do is trigger chemotaxis. That is, they attract macrophages to the area because, hey, there's either damage or a pathogen that we need you to clean up. So cytokines serve as a signal to tell the macrophages where the damage is. The highest concentration of cytokines occur at the site of release. So macrophages just swim up the cytokine gradient. Cytokines also trigger reactive gliosis. And we know in the long run, that's a bad thing. Now, the site that we need to uh, talk about for meningitis would be, of course, the meninges. The meninges are just layers of connective tissue. Here's the brain. Then we have the pia mater on the outside of that. Go one step further outside, we've got the arachnoid mater. And then the external layer is the dura. And there are two layers here, right? But... Anyway, dura mater, the outer covering. Periosteal layer, meningeal layer. The whole point of the meninges is to protect the brain, and it protects it in two ways. There's the physical protection. The dura mater is tough. Um, so that creates a nice layer between the brain and the skull, so brain can't directly contact bone. There's also chemical protection. In the uh, arachnoid mater, there's a diffusion barrier. So any nasty stuff floating around in the dura can't find its way into the brain. So all you really need to appreciate here, dura mater is tough for physical protection. The arachnoid mater is full of cerebrospinal fluid, providing a bit of physical protection, but importantly, a diffusion barrier. So that... Uh, anything that's in the blood, in those dura vessels, can't leak into the brain. And the pia mater is more of an anchor. That helps hold the arachnoid against the, the brain. So not much for protection, just there for the anchor. Now meningitis, uh, as you can see here, is more commonly viral than bacterial. That's a good thing. Uh, better outcomes with viral meningitis than bacterial. The risk factors are, of course, exposure to any of those neurotropic pathogens, so the bacteria and the viruses that they can infect, the meninges. Uh, not only exposure to them is a risk factor if you're not vaccinated against them. That's another risk factor. So you can see here the dramatic decrease in uh, meningitis cases after um, the vaccine was developed. So once vaccination was routine, about here, notice the precipitous drop-off in meningitis cases. So we go from several hundred every year to, oh, I can barely tell what that is, maybe several dozen. Of course, anyone who has a compromised immune function is going to have a hard time dealing with pathogens. That increases the risk of infection there. Uh, nervous system damage that can... Uh, decrease blood-brain barrier function increases the risk of infection. And that very young age is a risk factor for the same reason as nervous system damage. Both of these involve a compromised blood-brain barrier. Whether you're super young or perhaps super old and have dementia, if the blood-brain barrier isn't working properly, we can't keep, well, that doesn't help, we can't keep the infectious agents out of the brain. And so what's going on with meningitis? Um, exactly what you'd imagine. So some kind of virus or bacterium enters that cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. Here it is in cartoon format. 
That, of course, triggers inflammation, so our blood vessels become leaky. And since we just covered tumors, we already know where this is heading. So the inflammatory response is a good thing because it'll allow, of course, you know, us to handle the damage. But the fluid that comes along increases intracranial pressure and the same stuff as before happens. I won't hammer that in here. Blood-brain barrier permeability, when that increases, hey, we get more edema. Same problem as before. Now we've got another source of glutamate, white blood cells. So we had tumors releasing it in the last section. Now white blood cells release it. So again, increasing the risk of excitotoxicity. Encephalitis is similar to meningitis, except it affects the uh, brain tissue as opposed to the meninges. Uh, same risk factors. What we'll notice here is just a different site of infection. So over here we can see meningitis. Notice the bright meninges right here. So the meninges are lighting up in this MRI. But if we have a look over here, notice what's lighting up. The brain tissue inside of the brain, not the meninges. If this were meningitis, then the outside would show up nice and bright, but it wouldn't go into the brain tissue itself. That's not the case. Instead, this is encephalitis, so infection of the encephalon, the brain. Okay, same stuff going on here as far as, hey, we trigger inflammation, we got intracranial pressure and blood-brain barrier permeabilization. That's all the same. Slightly different uh, stuff to talk about would be how the viruses get in there. So could be crossing the blood-brain barrier. That's still true. Might even cross the placenta. That whole Zika virus, for example, can cross the placenta, enter the brain. We don't have a blood-brain barrier. Aha, okay. We can also sneak our way around the blood-brain barrier. So here's the new thing, retrograde axonal transport. Now, before we've heard of this is good, right? Neurotrophic factors. These are good. They keep us alive. How do they get from the axon to the cell body? Retrograde axonal transport. But guess what? Viruses can do the same thing. Oh, no. So this is why, you know, if you're bitten by a dog that has rabies or something like that, that site where the dog bites, the rabies virus can bind to um, proteins on the axons and get transported retrogradely into the central nervous system. No need to worry about that blood-brain barrier. Some viruses can sneak in inside the axon. Another example would be a herpes virus, for example, right? So this can infect, um, you know, nasal epithelial cells or something like that. They move retrogradely, affecting our cranial nerves. And hey, what do you know? That retrograde transport takes them into the central nervous system. Okay, so that's just an added little bonus there. We have a new way of entering uh, the brain. Okay, what happens? Besides all that same intracranial pressure nonsense we just went through, if a virus has entered uh, the brain or the spinal cord, viruses reproduce by infecting cells. So let's say you're a happy little neuron over here. Virus infects you. And what it's going to do is make more of itself. So let's make our virus over here. Come on in. It reproduces, making a whole lot more of itself. This leads to you swelling up. Oh, now we're getting really concerned, right? We're chock-a-block with viruses. Hell, I'm just going to do this. And then finally, you explode. Boop releasing those viral particles so they can go and infect somebody else like this happy little neighbor over here that has no idea what's coming for it. So obviously the infected neuron is toast. 
because of the necrosis that's necessary for the virus to reproduce. Now, different viruses target different neurons. So it's not like any virus can infect any neuron. No, no, no. West Nile virus tends to create a whole lot of motor abnormalities because it tends to target motor neurons down here in the ventral horn of the spinal cord or motor neurons up in the thalamus and brainstem and cerebellum. Polio virus also affects neurons, right? It tends to be the lower motor neurons as well. Um, herpes virus, though, that affects neurons mostly in the temporal and frontal lobes and the limbic system. Which, oh, by the way, that's what this is. I forgot to mention. This is herpes encephalitis. Notice where we're affecting temporal lobes here. So depending on the virus, that'll determine which type of neuron it can affect. And once infected, that neuron then uh, uh, allows the virus to reproduce and being the good host that it is, explodes to release its guests. Okay, just a couple of very rare things here. Uh, prion diseases, as you can see, are luckily very rare, so definitely less than one per 100,000. Um, the risk factors would be uh, a family history. Uh, that's what's going on over here in this Creutzfeldt Jakob disease patient. Let's go ahead and let this play out. Um, the other risk factor would be ingesting infected meat or brain matter. So if you eat meat or brains from an animal that had um, the prion disease, then you're at risk of getting it. Now, not every prion can jump between species, but are you willing to risk it? Uh, so eating human meat is a bad idea. Uh, cannibalism is one of the ways that we discovered prion diseases. Uh, and this might make you think twice when you consider eating one of those brain sandwiches at the, at the, uh, at the fair. Now, you'll notice this uh, feller here is just kind of unable to move. Uh, he just has these myoclonic jerks going on. Uh, what's going on here is just the nonspecific destruction of all neurons. So notice what's going wrong here. Everything. Motor function, sensory function, cognitive function. Everything is affected. And there is no treatment. And once we see these neurological symptoms, death occurs within about a year. What's going on here is just simply a misfolded protein. That's it. You don't have to have a family history. It, it can increase the risk, but what's going on is there's this normal protein called the cellular prion protein. That's the PRP, prion protein C, cellular. This one's normal. Look at it. It's happy. We don't know what it does, but it probably does something. It doesn't seem to be that important. You can knock it out and mice live. But anywho, we've got this protein. And normally it's quite happy. Until it misfolds. Notice, very different structure. Okay, what that misfolding really does is expose hydrophobic residues. It doesn't become a skull and crossbones, obviously. Okay, that misfolding makes it very stable and allows it to cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, why does it misfold? Bad luck is a good explanation there. So you've got that, you know, one in a million chance or something like that. Um, there are heritable mutations within the prion protein that make it more likely to misfold. But there's nothing that has to happen. It, it's just bad luck. It could spontaneously misfold. You dramatically increase your risk if you eat infected meat. So if you eat something that has this misfolded prion protein... And it's what we call the scrapey prion protein. That prion protein goes back, affects all your normally folded prion proteins, and makes them misfold. So this thing propagates itself. And that's what allows consumption of infected meat to lead to prion diseases. So, you know, probably don't eat brains. Plus, what the hell? It's all fat. Anywho, this misfolded prion protein has a whole bunch of hydrophobic residues. And what that means to the cell is my proteins aren't folded properly. And here's the deal. The scrapey prion protein is very stable, so we can never refold it properly. So the cell does the only thing that it knows to do, and that is have the unfolded protein response. What this looks like in a neuron is apoptosis. 
what it looks like in an astrocyte is reactive gliosis. And that's exactly what we can see up here. So here's control. We don't see the scrapey prion protein. Oh, by the way, that's named for the disease, scrapey. So that's what it is in sheep. Uh, in cows, it's called mad cow disease. Okay, but we do see this scrapey protein up here in this prion-infected brain. What we also see is the loss of synapses and dendrites. Look down here. Ooh, dendrites everywhere. That's what we should see. Much sparser up here because the neurons are dying. And when they die, they leave these big holes. That's why it's called spongiform encephalopathy. The brain looks like a sponge. That's not what we see in normal brain. And we see signs of inflammation. That's reactive gliosis right there. Over here, nothing. Last fun one for you. Uh, there's the brain-eating amoeba, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's, a, it's an amoeba that eats brains. Uh, this is very rare. And uh, the only risk factor is going into a freshwater lake in the southern United States where this thing lives. Uh, so if you're going to swim in the lakes down south, uh, put on some uh, nose clips because the way that this gets into your brain is by going into your nose and then burrowing its way in. And that's why you, you see it eating all along this path. So here's the olfactory bulbs. Here's where it got in. And then it just spreads out, munching along on the brain. What it does is use this little flagellum here to poke into the... Uh, to poke through the cell membrane, causing necrosis. Then it gobbles up the inside of the cell, reproduces, and moves on. The way that we diagnose this is by taking a CSF sample and looking for it. There it is. I believe there are less than a handful of survivors, so it's pretty much 100% fatal. And that's probably not the sunniest place to end, but that is where we're going to end. Uh, luckily, this is very rare, and you can get, uh, and you don't have to worry about being infected if you either don't go in a freshwater lake, go to a swimming pool instead, or put on your nose clips if you just have to, or have all your fun time activities uh, up north. Anywho, that about concludes it. If you have any questions, make sure you fill out that questions box so I can help you out there. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in class.